Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dealing with Literary Rejection. Um, I am super glad to see everyone here uh, to talk about uh, getting uh, rejected. Hurrah! <laughs> um, I'm your moderator. My name is Karen Osborne. I'm an author. Um, this is my book, Architects of Memory, and I got rejected. I don't even know how many times um, on, on my way to having it published by Tor Books um, this, uh, this August 25th. Um, and that's the, what I'm going to say about that. Um, but I, so we're going to talk about today rejection. And that's why I'm qualified to run this panel because I have been rejected and everyone here has been rejected. And we even have some people here who have been doing their rejecting. So you're going to get their sort of, uh, their sort of uh, look-see as to, to how that works. So I'm going to ask the panel to introduce themselves and um, tell us whether or not um, you have been rejected and or if you do the rejection and maybe how that's different. Um, talk with Margaret. I'm Margaret Riley. I am the owner and submissions editor for Changeling Press. We have a small press publishing. And I collected my share of rejection letters a long time ago. And I do let that be an influence when I write them these days. Morgan? So, hi, I'm Morgan Hazelwood. I'm a blogger, vlogger, and querying writer. So, I am right in the query trenches right now, collecting all those lovely, lovely thanks but no thanks letters. And occasionally the, can I see more? Um, Larry? I'm Larry Hodges. Uh, you can, I write both science fiction, fantasy, both short stories and novels. You can see some of my novels in the background. And since we're in this perennial political world, you can see Campaign 2100, Game of Scorpions, is probably my best novel, which covers the election for president of Earth in the year 2100, when the whole world has adopted the American two-party electoral system. Yeah. There's also a third-party moderate challenge, and it's a drama and a, you know, and a satire. Um, I'm on this panel because I have received more rejections than you can possibly imagine. I've also sold 110 short stories and four novels. So it, it, it's a balance. It's and a lot Joshua. of sales. And Joshua. Um, my name's Joshua Bilmes. I'm the president of Jabberwocky Literary Agency, which I founded uh, 26 years ago. Um, so I get to reject people who want me to represent them, and I get to collect lots of rejections from the manuscripts I send out to uh, publishers, so both sides. Okay, so for those of you who are with us, um, I am not monitoring the chat. I am monitoring the Q and A. Um, so if you so if you have a question for any of our illustrious panelists, uh, please put it in the Q and A because I will not see it in the chat. Um, uh, but I will see it in the Q&A. So uh, if, if you get a question, just throw it in there and hopefully we'll get to as many as possible by the end of the panel. Um, so everybody, uh, just tell me a little bit about how you handled the first rejection you ever received. Uh, and then maybe how you handled the most recent one. And tell me a little bit about what might have changed. What, what happened or what did you do to help yourself get from point A to point B? You just jump in or do you call Just jump right in. Well, we'll try that, see if it works. Okay. I'll, I guess I'll go first. My, uh, my first rejection was from a long, long time ago. And of course, I think my, my reaction to the first one was very similar to the famous Snoopy cartoon, where you want to write back and say, no, 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 I, I meant for you to publish this and send me a big check. You know, uh, you know but, you know, they just misunderstood that part. And, uh, you know, um, over the years, though, I've actually found a, a simple way of coping with it, which to me is very simple. To me, it's all, I just, tr the way I deal with it is to treat it like a game. To me, it's a game where uh, if you put something out there and they reject it to you, you've just received a Monopoly a card, chance card saying, go back three spaces. So you send it back out immediately and you stay in the game and you keep doing it 
until it sells. I mean, there's some things you may, based on the rejection, if you get detailed rejection that tells you some things you might do something, we'll probably have questions about that later. But in general, I just like to look at it as a game and I just simply keep sending it out. And the nice thing is eventually, it'll, you know, if you keep working your way down, if it's well written, eventually it usually sells. And then you can say, I won. <laughs> <laughs> I think the first rejection I ever collected was the, the same issue that I run into as a, on the receiving end was I sent the wrong thing to the wrong house. And when I got the rejection letter, I was like, well, how can you not want this? You can change your, your guidelines just to fit my book, just because it's 30,000 words longer than what you wanted. You know, we can, we can take care of that in edits, can't we? Or you can just publish longer books. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> uh, so I, I actually have my uh, first rejection letter up on the screen right next to me. My first rejection was on March 4th, 2016 at 4.32 p.m. But from um, Ben Grange, the uh, ass agency assistant for Joshua Bowman. <laughs> and um, he'd been open for, I think, six weeks, and I knew it wasn't a great fit, but I figured I might as well throw it out there anyway. So when I got a very polite form rejection, um, wishing me the best and saying it's subjective, I got back to my round of revisions and kept working. So um, I... I um... My first rejection was in high school when I attempted to actually write fiction, which I am not as good at at editing it. Um, and so I sent a short story to Analog and got rejected and then wrote back to Stan Schmidt to complain about the wording of the rejection letter. <laughs> um, and the weird thing is he wrote back, which is why I'm here today, but that is not the uh, recommended course of action when you are rejected. Okay. Um, so do you have to keep, you know, a, a really iron, iron, iron armor up? Like, like you do have to put yourself in a little iron box of, of nothing will ever hurt me. Um, or can rejection hurt sometimes and be okay? And how do you get more comfortable with that rejection as a writer? Um, which is, you know, which is what writers generally do. Um, and to prove that, I'm going to ask our illustrious tech, Matthew Shogren, to put up a poll for all of you so you can see what exactly. <laughs> so just click that, click that really quickly. Mm -hmm. There we go. So I'm seeing, you know, as you're seeing, I'm seeing 10 people. Uh, yes, I have. Yes, I have. There are no no's. There are no no's. I know I didn't put a no in there, but that's part of the whole. Um, so 74% of you have said yes, and 28% of you had said, I am not submitted anything yet, which is amazing because, um, we are so glad you're here because we are about to talk about some ways that when you, when you get rejection, not if you can help yourself get over that, get back out there and get your career and your writing thing that you want for yourself. Um, so let's talk about that. What are some ways to build that armor and does it always, or, or, or do you always have to be, I am a writer, I don't have, you know, you know, tell, tell, uh, tell me some ways how to, tell, tell me some ways how to do that. Once you've done, once you've had some experience, you start to have some confidence that eventually, you know, the stories might sell if you, you know, after you've sold a few at least. Um, so uh, to me, it's, it's not a matter of armor. It's more a matter of, okay, I'm, uh, I'm determined to get that thing to uh, sell. I'm like, as I said, it's like a game. I've, some of the stories are sold on the first or second try, very, very rare. Uh, I've had one story rejected 48 times and then sold. The bear story is, is one that gets rejected 47 times. And, but the 47th one actually came back with a detailed critique of it, which you don't usually get too much. And I remember thinking, and I was sort of like, oh, that's a great idea. So I went in and did a little rewrite of it. And then Galaxy's Edge had just opened up. And so I sent the, I, so I took the rewritten one, sent it to them, bang, professional and one of the top sales. Yeah, so I, you know, the idea is sometimes you can just do it that way. But the idea is 
I divide this, if it's a really good story, some, if it, you just keep sending out there, although sometimes you hold back because you don't want to send it to, the real, to a really weak market and then later on think, God, I could have sent this somewhere else. But I never really thought of it as armor. When I get a rejection, my first thought is, and who I hope I'm not going to turn off too many people. My first thought is, you fool, you didn't see the brilliance of this thing. And I look around, I hope no one heard that. And then I think, okay, where do I send it next? Um, so we'll say, go back there I... and talk about that as a coping mechanism. Because yeah, I think yeah, that's a do... really, really good coping mechanism, yeah. Larry. But, Fabulous. But, I, but one of the best things is, is you don't want to get a rejection and then think, okay, where am I going to send this next? I always have the next market ready in advance. So to me, it's almost a badge of honor that when I get a rejection, I, I send it out immediately. If I'm at the computer, immediately. I don't think I've had, unless I'm out of town or something, I've never taken more than a day to send something out again, unless I'm holding back for a specific market. So to me, the coping mechanism is to simply have another market ready. So I always have a list for every story when it's done and where, and where I'm going to send it to next and just keep going on down the list. Um, Sorry, I really appreciate that attitude because one of the most irritating things we get as a publisher is people who will send out the same story to all the people on that list at the same time. And almost everybody's submission guidelines will tell you no simultaneous commission, yep. uh, submissions. That's because most of us are working 50 to 60 hours a week. And if we spend the time to read your book, and we want it, we don't want to know somebody else already got it. <laughs> I really, do. some markets allow simultaneous submissions and sometimes I'll do that. I tend to go, I'm old fashioned, I tend to prefer to send it one at a time. To me, it's- Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, you, never, you never send it simultaneous submission to a market that doesn't allow it. Read the guidelines. Yeah. I think that's the first word, read the guidelines. Yeah. yeah. So Morgan, how, how are you handling it as a, a currently querying writer? Um, so, so Larry was talking more about the short fiction, which I'm, I'm dabbling my foot into, but um, I, I have a problem of every three to 10 rejections, I rewrite the whole thing. So I'm, I'm working to get past that uh, and be more confident in what I have, but I don't have any sales to prove my writing yet. So I, it might just be part of my process so far, but my coping mechanism really right now is to be working on some, send it out, be working on something else. And when it comes through, take a day, maybe a week, to like mourn, step away from writing for a week and then just get back to it. It, I mean, ex grief and grieving is part of the process. Just don't wallow in it. Don't stay there. Don't lash out because they might like your next book. And if you've already burnt that bridge, you've burnt that bridge. And from my perspective, one of the things um, to keep in mind is everything gets rejected. I have never sent out a submission where everybody has offered on it. The closest I ever came was The Speed of Dark by Elizabeth Moon, really? where the only rejection came in from a publisher that I submitted because I didn't want them to feel left out, even though <laughs> I knew that the book wasn't right for their list. Um, but like, I mean, if I'm talking about The Kingdom of Liars by uh, Nick Martell, which just came out, um, uh, you know, we got more publishers who rejected that than offered on it. And that, and most of the deals I do, especially for a debut author, we are looking for the one editor that will buy it, which means there are 12 or 20 who are saying no to it. So I'm looking at the poll and a lot of you are still waiting for your first rejection. Um, I, and uh, first of all, it's okay. Don't, don't worry about it because um, how, so, so you might be wondering, you know, how do you read a rejection letter to see what it's really about? You know, you're going to get that rejection letter and you're going to read it and then you're going to be like, okay, what did they say? What next? What's a, what's a, um, what's a, 
how do I read that and go, what did they really say? Like, should I be worried if it's a, a if, if it sounds like a form rejection, like they send to everyone else? Is that a bad thing or a good thing? Um, so what should you look for in that letter? A lot of it depends on the uh, you know, market and the layer. Um, the majority of rejections are form rejections, um, especially if you go to the big markets. If you, when you go to the, the big markets, they get thousands of submissions. They have to pick maybe eight or 10 of them. The catch is that's not even true because they have sp spots reserved for the big names. So you might really be going for maybe four spots and they have 2,000 or 1,500 submissions. So it's very hard at that level, but the editor doesn't have time to give personalized ones. And one of the things that leads to is you get rejection after rejection, they're all form after form, and you get very depressed about it. And then after you've gone through the biggest markets, you start going to the small markets, the one that get 100 submissions and they publish 10, and they have more time. And it's when you get to them that you actually start getting more critiques and they tell you, oh, this is a good story, but there is a problem here and this and this. And then you start looking at it and say, wow, I, I'm gonna I'm a fix this. So you fix it and then you realize something. It's a much better story, except you've already submitted it to the major markets. I call it the, um, this time I've got right rejection syndrome, except it's too late at that point. So one of the things to do, and I'm sort of going off the topic here, one of the things that means is make sure you got it right before you send it out. That means don't just write the story. You might spend weeks going back and forth like I do, you know, before you actually send it out, sometimes months, but have some beta readers or someone, have some people critique it and never, I, I almost never send something out unless it's, I, that I've written, unless it's been, I've gone back and forth it for months because it, you're going to regret it later on when you've had this great, brilliant story that you've rewritten, but it's already been rejected by the 10 biggest markets. Yeah. Um, so I, I just wanted to jump in here right now. And one of the biggest things that I see in a lot of form rejections is I just didn't connect. Um, and then they go on to say how subjective the market is. And uh, for those of uh, on the panel who um, do do rejections, I've been told that this is because that's a very hard thing to argue with and you're less likely to get people writing you back to tell you how wrong you were. Um, is, is this correct? Personally, I send out a lot of form letters that say, this doesn't meet our submission guidelines. And that's a real shame because I'm in the business of buying books, not rejecting them. I, I don't make a dime off the time I spend on sending out rejections. So yes, it helps if you connect with the characters, but you got to get to the point where you're going to read the first paragraph before that's going to happen. So if I'm looking at a submission letter that tells me you just sent me a 110,000 word epic and our website says our, our word count maximum is 50,000, then you're going to get a form rejection. And I think a lot of people apparently don't actually read submission guidelines. That's the only conclusion I can come to. Otherwise, why would I get a travel manuscript when we produce sci-fi fantasy romance? <laughs> it's, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with a travel manuscript. It's just not gonna happen. <laughs> it's really, really, really dumb to send something out without reading the guidelines first. Always read the guidelines. If you send them the wrong one, eventually they're gonna start recognizing your name as that person who sends science fiction to a fantasy market or some, or vice versa and other things like that. Just re And even more detail to too on exactly that line. Not only are the guidelines on the company's website for almost every publisher I can think of, but everybody has their own, their own little specialty as it were. And if you wanna know why you're getting rejected by this house, go read their books. Yeah, so you, you fit in with this, you know, do, 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 do your characters feel like they belong at this house? And, and that brings people? back, oh, and that brings back to um, connecting, ha ha having the editor connect to the story. Um, I have, um, so I have had stories where, for example, um, it had, like, the story has been rejected um, maybe like 27 times before it finds a home. So, so is it, is it important? 
um, to know more, like it, I mean, it, it, it and, and, and J Joshua, you went back, uh, just to go back for a second, you mentioned something about finding that one editor. Um, so when you receive a rejection letter um, from an editor that um, isn't really right for it, how, how, how can you as a writer um, build that sort of knowledge of um, what's right for your story and what's not? And do you get more rejections or fewer rejections once you know more about the market? Um, well, I, from my point of view, I think that the biggest thing in terms of the quantity of rejections, or at least the uh, percentage of things that I actually sell, is being busier, because that forces me to be more selective. When I started the agency 25 years ago, I had plenty of time to take on things that maybe could sell, because I'm like sitting around alone in my apartment, I need things to do. Now that I take on things that I am absolutely convinced I can sell, well, I sell most of them. Um, so that I'd say is probably from my perspective, the biggest difference. And then when it comes to actually looking at the letters that come in, the biggest thing is do we have consensus? Um, are a lot of people saying the same thing? Or is everybody saying different things? And if a lot of people are saying the same thing, can it be fixed? Um, I have a manuscript that I'm sending out right now, which the adult editors say is too YA, and the YA editors say is too adult you can't fix that. So you just have to kind of say, um, you know, like maybe you could rewrite the whole book to try and get it more one age or the other. But really, if that's the rejection you're getting, you can't fix it per se. So that's one of the things I'm hearing from all of you is that um, rejections are often not actually value judgments. Um, do no, you agree, disagree, and if so, how? Like value judgments on the value of your uh, writing as a writer, for example. Um, it's more, is, is, is it more like I'm not, you know, it's just maybe not something that they're publishing at the time. Um, but you as a writer, should you automatically go, oh God, it, it's it's because so often you know you know these these books and these stories are our babies and to get rejected it hurts but is it sometimes just not a value judgment and and and, and where of a business sort of decision it's always a business decision mm -hmm. can i make this book work and can i make it sell because if you put all of the money into a book that it takes to produce it and you don't make any of it back it won't be around long as publisher <laughs> yeah. james james maxey who's a, pro, a pretty well-known author at this point he told me a story about his original series the the bitterwood series there's a chance he's even listening in right now um the bitterwood series is brilliant it's really really good but he said he had all sorts of problems selling it I, the, the agents and, and publishers didn't really want it for a very simple reason. It looked like a fantasy series because it's all these things about dragons. Spoiler alert, cover your ears. If, you know, I'll give you three seconds to cover your ears for a spoilers alert. Good. <laughs> okay, it's actually science fiction. And you, you find this out halfway, about one third halfway through the first book. And because we have this novel that's all about you know, fantasy and science fiction, he was told over and over, they didn't know how to sell it. Can you sell, this is a science fiction when it's all about dragons? No. Can you sell it as fantasy when it's actually hard sci-fi? No. So they had great difficulty. He said he had to make choices later on where he had to be very specific one or the other. Yet, that's, it was really good. I'm, I'm actually contemplating my next novel now and I have a problem and I have some, a similar situation. So I'm trying to decide how to, I've got, I want to do a novel that's very hard sci-fi with one pure fantasy element. And it's like, ah, in fact, I'm curious if others here have any comment whether I should stay away from that. <laughs> There's a lot better market now for cross-genre than there were 
was when I was first getting started in writing as an author. Right. That's been a few times. <laughs> Let's go back to rejection. <laughs> Just, I mean, that, that, that's a fabulous question, um, but we'll put it towards the end if we can, if we can have time. And so if we can push more towards back the reje to, to, to rejection. So. Um, how can rejection make you a better writer? Well, feedback. <laughs> yeah. I'll leave back. You keep trying harder, you know? You might have thought you were done, but then when you go back and look at it again, because of all the rejections, you're like, oh, I can make this stronger, I can make the stakes higher, or, you know, more emotional impact, or what have you. Yeah. There's two types of feedback, or, or rejections you get that give you feedback. Of course, every now and then, you get ones that actually have real feedback, and then you look back and maybe fix it up. Um, occasionally they even will say, you know, you might even say, would you, if, would you be interested in a rewrite? And that's actually worked several times. They say, yes. And then it sells that after you do that. So it's sometimes important to look at that way. Another one though is when you, suppose you keep submitting to Asimov's or analog or something and you keep getting rejection. Then one time you suddenly get one that's personalized. It's like, yeah, dear Larry, I, li I actually like this story. You know, like that. I kind of lost me on this one part here, but it was really, you know, you're getting a personalized one from one of these big name editors. It's like, wow. Um, then you, of course, go back and say, by the way, would you, would you be interested in a rewrite or something? But the very fact they do it tells you you're getting closer and closer to that type of thing. Um, I've sold several stories on that way, but the, the, the very fact that they send you a personalized one means you've got a foot somewhat in the door a little bit. And maybe you should send them your absolute best work soon <laughs> since since so many um writers sometimes struggle with telling if it's a very nice kind form letter or if it's actually personalized one place to uh go for short stories is thegrinder.com.org um not grinder the grinder um it's the submission grinder and sometimes people post like rejection letters that they've gotten for longer stuff query tracker online is where people will share rejection letters that they've gotten. So you can compare what you got against what um, other people have received. Yeah. If you get an actual personalized letter, that tells you that somebody actually opened the book and started reading. And that happens, I would say, on maybe two to three percent of the submissions we receive. And I think that's probably fairly accurate across the board, though. Um, Publishers talk to one another. We're not like, you know, mortal enemies or anything. We, we do have publisher organizations. And the, 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 biggest, um, the biggest complaint all the other publishers I know have is receiving submissions that they can't do anything with. Um, so if we get something that, that's, that's, that obviously meets the, the general guidelines and we start reading, we want that book. We you know we're investing time and energy in it. If there's something that's just not quite right, and we write back to tell you about it, ask for a revise and resubmit. Please do so. That means we're already we're trying our best to figure out how to make this piece work so we can buy it because that's what we you know it's what we want. But there's this one issue, or two or three. <laughs> I, I had a friend who um, writes for and sometimes illustrates um, web comics who loves the plotting and he sent um, a story in and he got a rejection letter that he thought was formed that asked if he had anything else. And I had to explain to him two years later, no, that was good. <laughs> so that's very good. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a, a revise and resubmit is the, yeah. the, the gold standard of rejection right. letters. We right. really wanted this, please, can you just fix this? <laughs> and that just to mention is one thing where I've had to learn over the years um, to get better at is being very explicit when I want a revise and resubmit. Yeah. 
because there are authors whom I've sent like two page detailed rejection letters to, which I'm thinking ought to kind of be indication enough that I'm <laughs> interested in the work. I just sent you, you know, 500 words and they're like, but should I resubmit it? Is he looking for, so, so I've had to learn, uh, he, um, and I'm talking even from like halfway through my career, Peter Brett once posted on Twitter, the first like rejection letter that he got from me, which would have been the mid 2000s when I'd been in the business 15 years. And I was like, oh my God, did I send a letter like that to somebody? Because now I'm trying to just bend over backwards and add sweetness. I think you have promise. I think you can do this. Send it to me, which I really went a long time not doing. <laughs> One of the whole reasons behind a form of rejection too is that it keeps you from saying things you really shouldn't say. I, I have, um, because our content includes some adult content, we tend to get things that I really feel like forwarding to the FBI sometimes. And you, 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 try, you learn through practice not to say that essentially out loud. <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to jump in here with, um, sometimes you get a rejection letter that does have advice, but it's completely wrong for your story. Instead of getting angry and throwing it away, well, you can do that for five minutes. <laughs> Realize that you didn't set up the story right and look at how you can make the expectations flow so when you hit that point, the reader's like, oh, of course, now I see where you were going. So, so we have even, some, yeah. oh, no, go ahead. I was just gonna say, even when they get it wrong, they're pointing out where you can do better. That is very, very true. Um, rejection can often be a sign that um, uh, you're not connecting with an audience or the right audience, right? And is, is, is that kind of what I'm uh, hearing from you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so we have some audience questions. Uh, I, I, I figure um, let's take some of those and then dip back into um, some, some sort of ways not to take it personally. Um, so we have, uh, a question from Patricia Henry, um, and Patricia asks, what's the best attitude to take towards rejection to be most constructive? First thing is to be professional. Um, there, you do not want to burn your bridges by sending back that, you know, by responding. Josh gave the example about how he responded once, but, you know, he also said that's not what you usually want to do. Um, they, they send out a lot of rejections that, you know, and they can't get into a personal one-on-one -on -one with each writer. They can't explain things. Even if you get a rejection that seems to critique it and then say something that's completely wrong about the story, you have to stay out of it. Be professional and be polite. And, you know, again, just move on to the next market, whether it's a short story or a novel. Um, just be professional about it. At some time, at some point, you're going to have to put your pencil down and submit. You've got to get it out there. So, you know, when you go through and you pick agents and or um, markets to submit to, maybe mix it up with the top tier that you're really looking for and some of the mid-grade ones and just get it out there, get it over with, rip the Band-Aid out and off and get it out there. Um, for me, I, I have, you know, first first rejection as a Facebook life event, because it is a process and you've got to get used to it and you've got to put yourself out there. Maybe the best attitude is Google the Robert Heinlein rules, rules, the six rules, which you can Google them, but I actually wrote them here. I, I cheated. I took some notes in advance. Um, there's six rules and Listen closely when I get to number three, because number three is the controversial, misunderstood one. But the six rules of Hot Rubber Highlander, rule one, you must write. Rule two, two, finish what you start. Rule three, you must refrain from rewriting except to editorial order. 
That's the kind you can come back. You might want to Google that all the discussions that rule four, you must put your story on the market. Rule five, this is where I'm a professional. You must keep it on the market until it has sold. Rule six, and this is where a lot of people mess up also, start working on something else. <laughs> so as far as the attitude, I think you should, five of those rules are obvious. That's the perfect attitude. The one about uh, refrain from rewriting, it really means, I think he means, and there's a lot of controversy about this. I think he means don't send it out until you think it's really, really ready. And once it's really, really ready, you don't want to keep rewriting. If you do that, you're going to spend your entire career second guessing yourself. So you send it out, move to your next one, and instead of trying to rewrite something that should already be your best, make something else your best so it's ready and send that out. But if you happen to get something from Margaret or Josh saying, by the way, you know, this is, if you could do this, this, and this, then you saw, ooh, editorial order, then you fix it up and go from there. But I think that he's also kind of getting at one of the points of looking for consensus, because we do have a client who basically every time a rejection letter comes in, they want to immediately rewrite the novel because of the feedback in that one rejection letter, which is overdoing it a little. You, you can't write a personal version of your novel for <laughs> everybody who sees it. Um, and That's very true. That's very true. Sometimes you just have to let the, the readers make their own <laughs> leaps of faith. <laughs> Question from uh, Bernie Lore, uh, and I really apologize if I if I um, mess up anyone's name. Um, at what point should you give up on a story and move on versus rewrite and edit? And how do you make that decision? I feel like we were kind of going there, just about to talk about that. So how do you um, how do you say okay, this is not really what I want to continue with? Mm -hmm. My personal thing is, okay, I start with the idea that I don't send something out until I personally feel it's ready. However, sometimes after it's got a lot of, a story's gone through all the major markets, I usually, you know, there's about 10 major, I would say 10, 12 really major markets. About that point, I look at every story and I'd say, okay, this is get, has been rejected by them all. There are now two possibilities. Possibility one, I kind of give up on the story, but kind of give up to me means I'm going to keep sending it out. But now instead of trying to get into Asimov's or, you know, one of the ones like that, I just start sending it down. But, you know, even if it means going eventually to the penny on market once. So I just keep sending it out. However, if you really like the story and you believe in that story, after you've done that, you might still send out to some of the good other markets. But hold back on maybe and maybe a market will come up. Now I'm talking about short stories in this particular case here. But the idea is if it's a, if it's a story that you really think is good, the last thing you want to do is, which I've done several times, is to send it out, sell it for a market that's you know, read by 100 people. And then there's a calling for an anthology that you fit perfectly. And it's like, oh, I can't send this story to them. So if you really, really believe in that story, you might hold back on it. Now, as far as, I think in this, I think the question is more for short stories because novels, if you've written an entire novel, I guess you don't usually want, I guess you can give up on it if you, after a while if it's been rejected by them all, let the others talk about that aspect. I'm going to add a question too to this, um, to this because it's kind of like a corollary. This is from Sarah McCallop. How do you balance uh, believing in your work and understanding when you need to do more work on the manuscript? So at what point do you give up and, it, and how do you balance believing in your work um, and understanding when you want to do more work? I think Joshua's point about uh, the consensus is, is really important. If you have one rejection letter, okay, you have a rejection letter. But if you have 12 rejection letters and they all tell you the same thing, maybe you should listen. <laughs> you, if there, there's a consensus, you should have gotten that before you sent it out by people who critique it. Like I sometimes use either Codex Writers or more, more recently, Critters.org. Critters.org, write that down if you're uh, interested, if you're a new writer. Critters.org is a perfect place where you can get your work critiqued by a whole bunch of people. And one of the nice things you learn as a writer is that when you send out to readers, a lot of them can't tell you 
how to fix a problem, but they're very good at identifying a problem. And you're going to find a consensus now. So the best thing is send it, have them look at it. And when you do that, you get this consensus in advance. You fix the problem and then, you, you know, before you send it out. Um, and um, I think also that you, um, one thing I, I, I tell authors sometimes is like, you are the reals on your novel that's going to keep it from going off track. If you stop getting advice in the book that speaks to you, that seems to be part of the direction you're trying to steer the train, then that's probably a point at which to say, you know, I'm, I am taking the train this way and, um, you know, and I'm good with that. Um, you always have to step back whatever feedback you get from somebody and kind of soul search a little and ask, do I in my heart think that this is going to make the book better if I do it? Or, or the story, obviously, short story, novel, whatever. Is it, do I think it's helping me go down the right track? I would agree a lot with that. The, the last thing you want to do is rewrite a book to specifically fit one house. If, if only one person has given you a specific kind of feedback, then if you do a rewrite completely to fit that, then maybe it was the wrong book to the wrong house rather than the book having an internal issue. Yeah, so I'm hearing from you, Margaret, like it's more of a, it's more of a question. It's, it's, it's more of a thing of maybe you are doing something right. Um, and no. you just have to believe in your own work. Yeah. It could be the perfect book, just the wrong mm -hmm. house. Um, I have a question here, uh, too, that's... Uh, um, and so, so someone writes, how do you know if you're not cut out to be a writer? And that question hurts my heart. It really does, because I think everyone is cut out to be a writer. Uh, that, that, that's what I think. I think if you write, you write. But I think that's a really interesting question to ask because um, it comes in with you receive a lot of rejections and it kind of, um, it, it does something to you if you get rejected over and over again. So you might start thinking, wow, it, 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 am I cut out to do this? Or um, so how would you answer that question, everybody? Okay, I'll go first again. The, um, if, you're, if you're a writer, you just have something to say and you just have to. To me, I'm constantly coming up with story ideas and my head will explode if I don't write them. So I just, you just simply have to, you just want to do it. Now, there's always going to be some who write just for themselves like that. But, you know, that's fun also. Some people write to, and they, they don't send it out because they're scared to, you know, that encourage you to do it. But the idea is you, if you're, the way you know if you're a writer is because you want to write. Um, yeah. There is the there is the other extreme. Um, there is a very infamous story about. Um, well, I'm hanging a blank on his name. Uh, oh, Harlan Ellison. He was at the a uh, writing workshop, and I've heard this firsthand from numerous people. So it's a true story where he said he would actually rip into people in his critiques, and people would start crying and stuff like that. And he said, you know, his argument was if he could convince you not to be not to write then you're not a writer anyway. And I think that's a little extreme. And he was actually banned from writing those things. Basically, the idea- Don't, is, don't take Harlan's advice. I'm sorry. Don't, don't do it. No, no, not Harlan. Harlan does not give that's good writing advice about yeah. that. The idea is you're going to hear that sometimes. The, you know, the writing, it all comes down to you. If you write and want, if you want to write and you write, that's two things. You have to want to and you have to do it. Then you're yeah. a writer. Simple as that. I, I even say, if you just write, you're a writer. Yeah. You, you can be a writer by writing. You just have to determine what level of visibility you want and what level is the market right for you. Can you find the right market? Are you willing to self-publish and do all the promotion? Or do you just want to put it up on your own website and let people see it? Or, you know, a shared website like AO3 or something. So it's up to you to decide how much work you want to put in and, um, whether or not the market is right for the type of writing that you do. 
and the market is unknowable. So we have, um, I'm going to jump in again and basically say we have a couple of questions that are, um, that are, uh, that, that, uh, have to deal with uh, just a few things, and we have five minutes. So let's do a lightning round, okay? Um, how do we know a rejection isn't because a person can't market the story, but because the story just isn't marketable or publishable? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I don't understand that question. I missed something somewhere. I, so do you think, um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to try to reword it for, um, I, I, I don't know if this is the, the reword from the person, but um, do you think every story kind of has a home somewhere? No. no. I mean, there are things that are objectively bad. Um, you know, there, there really are. Um, and... So how not might you know though, if you're a writer and you're getting all these rejections and you might not know how how do you know or come to know that oh maybe this isn't just what people want right now critiques mm. seriously critiques. if you're not ready to submit to a publisher then the the way to go to get ready is to have objective viewpoints from multiple people who are there specifically to tell you what's right and what's wrong with this book. Right. That, this is why I recommend what's right, then you gotta listen to the what's wrong to go with. It. I, Larry was absolutely spot on on that. I, I would kind of love a form rejection that is great writing. We don't have a market. Sorry, see you later. Um. I've written some of those. <laughs> This isn't right, but we'd love to see something else from you is really one of the, one of the right next to a revise and resubmit top this, tiers. This, this one you know, here. To, to, to give this really one specific example, we took on a book called um, No Saving Throw, which is a cozy mystery set in a lark background. Um, and the, the audiences for those two things are diametrically opposed. That would be an example of a book that could be rejected for not having a market that isn't actually a bad book because very few people will try and sell something where the two audiences don't have any overlap in the Venn diagram. So the next one here is, um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, is self-publishing a bad word? Will a history of self-publishing make my work less likely to be accepted later? Uh, or will it get more rejections? And how should that be handled? That depends on how you do it. If you put out an unedited book that gets a lot of bad reviews, and you put it out at 99 cents for a 100,000 word novel, then yeah, no, no publisher is going to touch you. Because and, uh, when somebody goes to look at your previous work, they're going to see those kind of reviews that go, we just can't get past that. You and might I have think another so. pen name at that point. But other than that, just because you self-published doesn't mean I'm not going to look at your work. Usually that means you know how to market, you know how to go through edits, you know how to deal with the, the situations that are going to come up in editing and we won't hold that against you unless you did it very badly. And I think it's both because there can be good things that are self-published, like the book I talked about earlier with the adult and young adult editors each think it's for the other audience. Maybe readers don't actually care if you can put it before them, but there are also some marketplace um, distortions where self-publishing uh, might be better off by the word because people want to get longer books for their um, credit, for their monthly subscription, or quantity, where there are things you can do in self-publishing that you can't really get away with in traditional publishing. Um, and that is time. Thank you. I. 
uh, thank you so much for everybody joining us today uh, about uh, how to deal with literary rejection. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. Uh, de definitely, um, definitely, uh, the answers to your questions are online. Keep on, keep on coming to events like this um, in like Balticon, other cons, um, because you have writers like this and agents and editors who all love to come out and answer these questions for you. Um, so if anybody wants to do, anybody wants to toss one last thing at the, at the, at the rejection board. Um, I'll, I'll recommend that again, that critters.org since they do both short stories and novels and allows you to get that feedback. There's I'm other groups also, up. that's just the one I've been using recently. You can put up a link on the, the chat. Critter, yeah. Critters is for critiquing. That's what the critters words comes from. Right. Um, Joshua is saying uh, that he'll hang out in the lit writing post panel and discord for further chat. So um, if you want to head over to discord right now uh, and uh, just chat a little more, um, maybe some of our panelists will head over there and um, you can continue chatting about rejection and why it hurts and helps. So thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.